welcome back to the uh, fourth session on um, human resources management part 1. Uh, we talked about what human resources is, we talked about uh, jobs, uh, job analysis, we talked about uh, the importance of job analysis uh, today and we talked about recruitments and staffing. Uh, today we will talk about uh, performance evaluation and before that we will do a little bit of, uh, uh, we will have a little bit of discussion on organizational socialization, what happens when employees join an organization. So uh, again as always I will share the sources I have used with you, uh, there is this book by uh, Briscoe, Schuler and Klaus, there is a book by Cascio, there is a paper by Cleveland, Murphy and Williams. I uh, suggest that if you really want to know more about performance appraisal, you should go through this paper. It's it's a brilliantly written paper. Uh, it appeared in the Journal of Applied Psychology in 1989. Still very relevant. Uh, then there is a book by Gilmore and Williams, who is uh, who are the editors of this book, and different chapters have been written in the book by different authors. Uh, there is this book by uh, Gomez, Mejia, Balkin, and Cardi. There is a paper by Gray uh, that talks about performance appraisals. There is a book by Modaf and Divine on organizational communication. Uh, and uh, there is a paper by O'Boyle. I am sorry I forgot to write the name down here. I will add the name of the paper um, in the uh, assignment. I forgot to add the name of the paper in this. So uh, anyway, uh, so these are the sources that I will be referring to. So let us immediately start with, um, and of course there is a book by Dessler and Varke that I forgot to mention uh, in the sources. Uh, the first uh, thing that employees go through when they join an organization is employee orientation and onboarding. Now onboarding is a process that provides new employees with the information they need to function effectively in an organization. Onboarding means you bring the employees on board. We bring the employees, we, we bring them in, we select them, we tell them what to do and we help them <coughs> become familiar with the environment they find themselves in. Purposes of onboarding or orientation are, we make the new employee feel welcome and part of the team. We make sure the new employee has the basic information to function effectively, so when the employee joins. We introduce the employee to other members of the organization. This should be done in some organizations, especially those that recruit people, that hire people on, um, you know, hire consultants and don't hire them in bulk, um, or that hire people one at a time. This process is not really uh, happening there. So this is uh, important. Then uh, every new employee needs to know where they can go. Uh, uh, to uh, you know find out more about their salary, about their benefits, about their emoluments, about accommodation, about health, about this and that. So it is nice to have an orientation program. Uh, then uh, another purpose of <coughs> sorry orienting uh, employees is to help the new employee understand the organization in a broad sense. It is always nice to inform employees about the history of an organization, about the vision and mission of the organization and about where the organization might be headed. So it is always important because these things help the employee develop uh, an understanding of the organization and also um, figure out or, or uh, gauge where they might be fitting in and how they might be able to contribute to the best of their ability and how the organization in turn will help them achieve their personal goals. So uh, you know knowing where the organization has been situated historically, socially, um, you know in the uh, sector that the organization functions in. It would be uh, and who the competitors are, uh, what we are moving towards, what are the kinds of challenges the organization faces. It, it really helps people develop a bond 
the newcomers develop a bond with the organization. Then starting the person on the process of becoming socialized into the firm's culture, values and ways of doing things. Now when we uh, manage something, when we say we manage something, we are essentially referring to how we uh, take things from when we plan them, from when we want them to happen, to how we plan them, to how we take steps to make sure that our goals are achieved to evaluating those steps. So the cycle is very important and everybody has a different way of doing the same thing. Everybody has a different way of something as simple as entering an office and settling down. Some people will come in, switch on the lights, switch on the computer, switch on their electronic devices, immediately check their emails first thing and then move on to more orders of business. There are others who will come in and uh, immediately open their calendars to see what they need to do first. You know, if they have a meeting, if they have a calendar, they'll first look at the calendar, they may put away their things, they may have, they may bring in food that they may put away, uh, you know, put into the, uh, wherever they need to put their food, they may uh, need a cup of tea before they start the day, something as simple as that. Now moving on to more complicated or more, more work uh, related stuff, um, handling uh, day to day business, you know, getting updates from their subordinates is something that people uh, will do very differently. Some people will probably want their subordinates to submit something in writing to them. Others will probably uh, let the subordinates know that they have arrived in the office and call subordinates to their office for a quick update on how things have uh, happened or what has happened in the past several hours. Doctors do this, you know, especially doctors who um, who have patients in house. The first order of business for them is to go to the ward and find out how their patients have uh, done or how their patients have been the previous night. So it is very important and, and everybody has a different way, every doctor has a different way of doing these things. So uh, it is very important uh, to bring people in and let them know what might be important in an organization and, uh, and then get them started and help them align their ways of doing things with the way the organization wants them to do things or needs them to do things. Okay. The orientation process can uh, consist of in some organizations an employee handbook. Uh, it is a very essential, very helpful tool to have. If you do not have one, I suggest that when you join an organization, you, su you should uh, help them develop a handbook. Uh, there could be informal orientation, which could be through get togethers, outdoor activities, picnics, um, etc. And uh, there could be orientation technology, there could be online learning about the organization you come in and, you know, like when you install a new program on your computer, the program itself takes you through the first few steps. Sometimes when you join an organization, especially in virtual organizations or virtual teams, you are put through a process. You download a software, you download a program and the program guides you through the different steps that you will need to follow in order to become a part of that organization and do what is required to be done. So various ways in which orientation takes place. Uh, Let us talk a little bit about organizational socialization, various ways in which new employees are uh, integrated into the organization and made a part of the organizational uh, milieu. Um, some definitions of organizational socialization, again uh, you are not required to memorize these for your test or whatever evaluation will be happening later on in the course. I would just like you to understand these definitions. So according to Van Manen and Shine, the um, <coughs> organizational socialization is a process by which an individual acquires the social knowledge and skills necessary to assume an organizational role. Bullis uh, proposes that it is a process through which newcomers become organizational members, includes newcomer acculturation, employee attitudes and behaviors and the shaping of newcomers identities. 
when we talk about identities we mean how the employee or how the newcomer sees herself or himself as a part of the organization what do we want our organization to know us as what do we where do we think we will fit into the organization's structure and shape okay it is the organization uh, modaf and divine uh, feel that organizational socialization is the attempts of the organization to transform an organizational newcomer into a full fledged member by instilling into the person the organization's norms values and beliefs as well as the formal and informal role requirements associated with the person's position so what is expected on a formal level or an informal level etc so when new members join an organization the senior members are obligated to help the newcomer find ways of adjusting to the organization so that the organization so that the current ongoing practices in the organization are disturbed to a minimum okay after the new members are accepted as part of the organization they are able to share organizational secrets when you come into the organization um, you are able to uh, you know know what is going on know things that others outside the organization don't know separate the presentational rhetoric used on outsiders uh, to speak of what goes on in the setting from the organizational rhetoric from the operational rhetoric used by insiders to communicate with one another as to the matters at hand which means how do you represent the organization you may have one sort of feeling about the organization but what is the company line as we say when you represent the organization in an uh, in public uh, domain and understand the unofficial yet recognized norms associated with the actual work going on so how are people coming are they coming on time are they coming late what is acceptable what is not acceptable etc etc so once you become a part of the organization this is what you have access to socialization process includes or consists of Uh, i mean uh, one of the ways in which socialization can occur is collective socialization or individual socialization individually you join an organization one by one and you go and meet your seniors you go hang out with your peers you know you may have a uh, again i'm i i discourage smoking i don't like people burning their lungs um, you know it is uh, a complete no no so but then there are offices that have separate zones for uh, for uh, smokers and some people see it as a way to socialize though i think that's a very very bad idea um, again or having a common canteen common area where people can go and have their meals which i think is brilliant um, many times in iit we uh, are only able to meet our colleagues in the uh, common eating areas who and these are colleagues who we otherwise would not have known about so we go at meal times and then we bump into you know some colleague or another and we just start talking to them and we end up becoming friends with them so that's one more way so that is an individual socialization you just sort of get a feel for the organization the other is collective socialization which means when a group of people join the organization they are put through a Um, a group of activities social activities where barriers are broken ice is broken they become familiar with each other formal versus informal socialization process again uh, depending on uh, the the uh, formality depending on the procedures associated with the socialization they don't really consider a newcomer as a newcomer you're not labeled as a newcomer and identified as a newcomer you become part of the organization as soon as you join the organization so uh, you know they they become regular organizational members informal socialization uh, uh, that is informal formal socialization is when you newcomers are segregated um you're labeled as a newcomer and then after a while you know after uh, you your probation period is over or you finished your training you become part of the flock and new people come in 
sequential versus random socialization processes again sequential socialization is the degree to which the organization specifies a certain set of steps to come to be completed in order to advance to the target role so you come you do a b c go you get accommodation you you know get everything in order you you uh, perform your duties one set of duties and then you move on to the next level in that hierarchy or become a permanent member and then you are accepted as part of the main group otherwise or maybe you have a separate eating place and so you know you come and uh, sort of become part of the regular uh, uh, regular group or, or the group of, of regular full time employees. So, and random socialization is when the sequence of steps is not known, you do not know when you will be advanced to the next level, when you will become a part of the in group of the boss and when you will still be out of the bosses uh, in group or when you will move to the next level in the hierarchy of the organization. So, that is random. Uh, fixed versus variable socialization, fixed socialization is uh, similar to sequential, but with a timeline. Uh, variable is similar to random socialization, but uh, you know the, the time again here the focus is on time not on the steps you do not know even if you complete the necessary steps you do not know when your turn will come to become a part a fully recognized integral part of the organization. Serial versus disjunctive socialization. So, in serial socialization we have mentors you come you join the organization you are assigned a formal mentor who guides you through the processes. Disjunctive socialization processes means that there are no role models you just come you join you sort of flap your wings you wave your arms and then you suddenly learn to swim in the water metaphorically speaking. So, you are left alone to discover the ins and outs of the position. Investiture versus divestiture socialization, there is a very popular play in uh, the US uh, known as I love you, you are perfect, now change. And I have taken these words from the title of the play. And uh, again, investiture socialization tactic affirms the personal characteristics and identity that the newcomer brings to the organization. So, we say we love you the way you are, you have come with a specific set of skills, please remain distinct. Your uniqueness, your unique selling point is your distinctness here, the special characteristics you have brought to this role. Divestiture socialization says or divestiture socialization practices are more like a melting point, uh, melting pot where you come in with your own characteristics and literally have to change everything about those special characteristics. So, again you know again this this is a modification uh, of the the name of the actual play and um, so the message that is given to the newcomer is that yes we hired you because of your special characteristics, but now you need to change ok. We love you you are perfect now change because you become a part of this organization. And I am telling you all this because these things have a, an implication for, uh, for uh, human resources managers ok. Human resources managers need to know how people have been socialized and how this socialization may have impacted the way they feel about the organization and maybe even organizational effectiveness ok. Uh, how do you ease a newcomer's assimilation into the organization? Uh, from the perspective of the new employees, if you are a new employee, collect as much information about the organization as possible. Again, the role of the HR manager is very important here that the HR manager can help the new employee collect the information that she or he requires uh, in order to become familiar with the organization and managers need to take special note of the progress new employees are making in the first few days and weeks towards adopting the values of the organization. So, maybe as a manager an HR manager can advise the immediate supervisor of the new employee to help them become comfortable. Uh, <coughs> as a new employee you can assess how much of your own culture you are being asked to set aside and that can have implications for your satisfaction. We, talk, uh, we talked about the job characteristics theory in uh, the previous uh, in, in the second lecture 
and this really relates to that you know how much of your own comfort level are you being asked to set aside in order to become a part of the organization you find yourself in so uh, that is something one needs to assess uh, managers also need to consider uh, you know where to draw the line how much they need to expect somebody to change how do you manage performance now that you have become a part of the organization you're in or you have taken in employees and they have sort of learnt the ropes and they have started working now what next the next thing that comes is performance hmm? how do we manage performance definitions of performance management performance management has a lot um, going on so uh, managing the business there is a paper by Hall in the book by Gilmore and Williams and in this paper uh, various definitions of performance management have been proposed the first is managing the business which is effective management is managing performance and is the responsibility of all managers so the ultimate output every aspect of the business managing every aspect of the business you know input uh, uh, moderation um, uh, sorry input operation output evaluation everything is becomes a part of the performance management uh, this term was first used in the 1970s by beer and Ruh, uh, and uh, they who emphasized the experiential aspects of performance management and highlighted the importance of feedback as a management activity in this process so how much did people learn and how much did they do uh, was were the two criteria that were used for assessing performance management um, the second uh, uh, you know the, the next part of this is the first formal definition by chartered institute of personnel and development uk 1992 they define performance management as a strategy which re relates to every activity of the organization set in the context of its human resource policies, culture, style and communication systems. So they say that the nature of strategy depends on the organizational context and can vary from organization to organization. Armstrong and Barron proposed that organizational socialize, uh, sorry, performance management is a process which contributes to the effective management of individuals and teams in order to achieve high levels of organizational performance. So as such, it establishes shared learning about what is to be achieved and an approach to leading and developing people which will ensure that it is achieved. So various definitions one focuses on the performance the other focuses on outcomes the other focuses on strategy yet another focuses on the process involved in getting from the stage of planning the goal to achieving it um, some uh, the connection between human resources management and performance um, you know some models that were proposed the first model uh, here that is referred to here is the model proposed by Fomburn, Tichy and Devanna in 1984 that described selection appraisal and development uh, that talked about influencing performance within the, the HR cycle so this model assumed that managing these HR activities could influence employee performance and they said that it's you know performance management uh, is a function of of uh, selection of the employees of giving feedback of monitoring their performance which is appraisal and development of their skills uh, so uh, uh, they said that once we take care of these three the employee performance overall can be improved but it did not offer any explanation of the processes involved so it didn't talk about the processes involved in each of these three aspects Harvard model of HRM recognized how stakeholder interests could inform certain areas of HRM policy formulation and how the implementation of these policies produced outcomes that have long-term consequences including organizational effectiveness so Harvard model said that maybe you know um, um, emphasized on the interests of the stakeholders emphasized on the uh, uh, what 
the 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 uh, people doing the work and the people being affected by the work that was done were being uh, uh, you know their personal characteristics and how their interests were and then uh, how these interests led to or influenced the policies that were uh, formed in the organization regarding the management of the people who were working in these organizations. Then we had guests theory of HRM, uh, you know, which described how HR policy implementation could lead to certain organizational outcomes. So, again this talked about the influence of policy on organizational outcomes, how the rules and the procedures and the policies that are laid down influenced what ultimately happened okay, and how that the outcomes, the, the uh, uh, end result and how looking at the end result or a an understanding of the end result influenced the employer, the performance of the employees. Okay. Strategic HRM again uh, we will talk more about this later, but it is essentially about managing human resources in such a way that every aspect of every uh, stage in a an organization's life cycle is uh, uh, you know seen in uh, conjunction in line with the interests of the people who are uh, uh, who are working on that aspect. Uh, then we have a business partner model of uh, HRM, which is a conceptual framework that describes how HRM operates as a business partner within organizations. So, business HRM is an essential uh, integral part of any business, but business partner model of HRM um, uh, sees this department as uh, not really as an assistive department or uh, activity, it sees human resources management as a an equal shareholder an equal stakeholder in the process in the process or uh, the organization is involved in people and performance model uh, uh, says that performance is a functional uh, is a function of abilities motivation and opportunity so various people have said various things have proposed various ideas regarding managing performance. Okay. Now, whose responsibility is the management of performance? Who decides who is going to be affected? Hmm? Uh, performance related work practices uh, include careful uh, selection, recruitment, job security, emphasis on providing career opportunities, uh, assessing how people are working, if they are doing well, they should be rewarded, if they are not doing so well, they should be you know reasons should be found out for why they are not doing well and helping people achieve their maximum potential training and learning and development people need to be satisfied with the salaries that they are being paid they also need to be able to achieve a balance between their work and personal lives they also need some challenge in their jobs they also need some autonomy in their jobs teamwork is another one so you know uh, uh, helping people work in teams and finding out why if at all they are uncomfortable with working in teams. Involvement in decision making is another one. Information sharing and extensive two way communication is yet another one. So, um, anyway uh, uh, all of these things are again these are the responsibilities of uh, uh, the human resources personnel and because all of these work practices are going to be affected by the kind of work that human resources personnel do. Okay. Performance management in practice, uh, performance management systems are developed, we will talk more about this in uh, 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 detail in the next class. Now, we come to performance appraisal, what is performance appraisal? Performance appraisal is came into prominence in the 1960s with the introduction of management by objectives, a program by you know in which management was done by objectives, it gained substantial popularity in the 1990s. 
So, uh, it is an exercise undertaken by organizations typically annually to map actual performance with goals decided previously. Now, in many organizations, uh, you uh, will find that the goals of every single employee are mapped. Every employee is asked or informed as to what is expected of her or him in the next year. And then, at the end of that, act, that um, either financial year or calendar year, employees are uh, brought face to face with their supervisors. Employees come and meet their supervisors and maybe a meeting takes place or an interview takes place or, or feedback is taken in writing from employees and they are asked as to how much they have been able to do. And if they have not been able to perform to their fullest potential, why they have not been able to do so. And if they have done better than what was expected of them, then they are rewarded. So, that is the uh, uh, that is called as performance appraisal. Now, psychological principles of performance appraisal are it, it should involve adequate feedback as to how they are performing. Knowledge of their output should be an integral part of performance appraisals. It should have clear attainable objectives. Okay. Performance appraisals should have uh, some, some targets you know, uh, it should be taken on with, with the idea of either helping improve employees performance or uh, rewarding them for excellent performance. And it should uh, uh, <coughs> be involved in the setting of tasks and objectives. Everybody cannot have the same kind of background, same kind of achievement, same kind of uh, potential, uh, the same kind of output. So, performance appraisals need to be uh, you know made a part of the setting of tasks and objectives um, in line with how the, the employee has been able to perform within that organization. All of us may be excellent performers, but in certain settings our performance tends to get better and in certain other settings our performance tends to go down. It is not a function of who we are, it is also a function of how the environment that we function in responds to us, responds to our efforts towards it. So, uh, all that should be taken into account while setting targets and uh, objectives and, and uh, you know it should be taken into account when our supervisors ask us to do certain things. They should also take our ability and inclination, willingness to do what we are being asked to do. So, uh, again you know as human resources, as, as students studying human resources, I think it is very important for you to understand uh, these implications. So, you are more sensitive to the needs of the people you end up working for. Okay. If you become a human resources manager, you should know what is going to affect the employees in the organization that you are working. So, that you can uh, get the maximum, uh, get the employees to access to work to their maximum potential and not really feel that they are working that hard. And uh, so, that employees are able to achieve their maximum potential without really realizing that they are doing it and they are rewarded when they outperform um, uh, the expectations of their superiors, which is unfortunately not really done a lot in many organizations. Now, why? Why should we or the uses of performance appraisals? Again, you will say that this is all a repetition, but there are subtle differences. Uh, one is salary administration. When I talked about uh, involvement in the setting of tasks and objectives, I essentially meant that you know how these tasks and objectives can eventually lead to various other things. So, salary administration. We need uh, performance appraisals in many places have been used to declare bonuses. So, everybody um, you know has a base pay and the bonuses are decided on the basis of what the employee has been able to achieve. Promotions, retention or termination, if you take in an employee and the employee does not perform, shows no improvement, does not do anything, does not make any progress, then why should the employee be kept? You know the employee should be fired. Uh, recognition of individual um, uh, performance. So, if somebody outperforms others, then that person should be recognized also. Layoffs, again you will say uh, hiring and firing, termination and layoff is the same thing, but layoffs in mass. 
so retention or uh, termination of individual employees or uh, you know uh, bulk layoffs bulk termination of employees performing below a certain level uh, identification of poor performance identification of individual training needs uh, if some employee is performing very well in one sector one area but not really doing so well in another area then it would help to give them the training they require to to become better uh, performance feedback telling people how they are doing determining transfers and assignments that would be another uh, <coughs> aspect of this uh, identifying individual strengths and weaknesses personnel planning how many people do we need for a particular task uh, how many jobs that are required to finish a particular task or achieve a particular objective so how many people do we need what kinds of skills do they need to have all of this information can also be gathered from the performance appraisals we know that uh, say most of the employees for example are able to work uh, you know the official timing is about 8 hours but considering the extreme weather conditions maybe it's too hot and there are power cuts maybe it is too cold and there is ice and snow on the road and people need to you know they they can try as hard as they want but they are not able to get to the office before 10 or 10 30 in the morning and they have to leave by 5 or 5 30 in the evening and they also need about half an hour to 45 minutes to have their food so you can keep thinking that okay you know we'll have an eight hour day and take saturday and sunday off but maybe the weather conditions don't allow it so you know how many people do you need uh, <coughs> maybe sort of instead of shrinking the work week you expand it and you say okay you come at 11 you leave at uh, you know 6 in the evening or 5 in the evening but then in lieu of that we will have a full day uh, working day on Saturday to make up for the time we may have lost. So uh, you know those things those adjustments can only be done through performance appraisals when you come to know that a lot of people are not able to perform to their full potential or you may the other side of it may be that you've hired a lot of people who you think you know you you may have initially thought that people may not be able to do a particular task but because you have been uh, lucky with your hiring you have been able to to um, to hire to select employees with certain qualifications certain energy levels and they are doing better than you expected them to do and again you know uh, the employees will not like that uh, what I'm going to say now but then you could maybe increase the workload of of uh, further of employees in future and not hire so many people or you could redistribute the work among a fewer employees and give the remaining employees some specialized training and give them something else to do so all that counts as personnel planning uh, uh, sorry and then determining um, organizational training needs uh, many of us have seen a life without computers without cell phones and I have mentioned this earlier also now uh, you know with the advent of computers with the advent of the internet with the advent of uh, cell phones a lot of things are happening online and uh, employees who have been used to this old style uh, you know Remington typewriters that go cut 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 and they use rice the, the uh, rice paper uh, for printing and we used to have these cyclo style machines now none of that is in use anymore and people are learning how to use the computer which most of the times ends up just being uh, used like uh, an electronic typewriter but sending emails responding to emails promptly keeping records of the information received through email so people may need training on an organizational level and that should be facilitated um, evaluate goal achievement uh, again uh, assist in goal identification you know whether they've been able to achieve what they started out to achieve assisting people in goal identification uh, finding out what they should plan to do within the next year reinforcing authorities evaluate personnel systems uh, reinforce authority structure you know who's boss who's number two who's the, the uh, caretaker of different aspects of, of uh, different departments etc and reminding people who they are answerable to um, identify organizational development needs so you know by speaking to individual people one can find out 
what the organization may be looking for um, as a whole criteria for validation research, documenting personnel decisions and you know if you need to fire somebody you need to be able to write down. So, appraisal serve as an excellent tool to document decisions whether to, to fire them, whether to promote them, whether to reward them, uh, whether to punish them and meeting legal requirements of course. Uh, some aims again communication, feedback, getting feedback from the employees regarding uh, the <coughs> work that they are doing regarding their comfort levels and giving them feedback uh, on how the organ what the organization expects from them getting feedback from them regarding the support they might need development uh, to identify opportunities for uh, professional development and motivation if you um, um, provide positive feedback praise an employee um, it always helps it always pushes the employee in a direction in which that can be taken up uh, uh, you know the, 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 or, or it always provides that energy that any employee needs to move forward. So, uh, appraisals are if, if done if carried out properly they are very very positive and of course, for empowering people by encouraging them to commit. So, you can reinforce things that people may have missed identifying performance dimensions, uh, how do you identify the performance dimensions from the employer's perspective. Uh, uh, individual differences in performance can make a difference to the company of uh, to the company perspective. So, employers want their employees to understand uh, you know how much they need to do and uh, every little bit uh, from the perspective of individual employees contributes adds up and, and contributes significantly to the development of the organization. So, uh, managers need to, to uh, understand they understand this and they just need to convey this to their employees that every little bit you know employees may say ok well if I do my work properly, but so and so does not it is not going to make a difference and it is up to the managers to convince their employees through the appraisals that every little bit every little contribution is going to add value to the organization uh, and uh, documentation of performance appraisal and feedback may be needed for legal defense especially in the case of negative reinforcement or termination uh, from and again you know uh, and because of this performance dimensions are very important you know clear cut guidelines clear cut written down statements regarding what is expected are important. Uh, the appraisal system provides a rational basis for constructing a bonus or merit system. If you want to reward employees, it is always nice to quantify things, it is always nice to tell them ahead of time what is expected of them and to remind them that they are being given something because they were able to achieve x, y, z. Uh, appraisal dimensions and standards can help to implement strategic goals and clarify performance expectations. So, you know you set a goal and people will try and achieve that goal and uh, once the boundaries are defined and you tell your employees that this is what they can do and this is what they are not supposed to or that they do not need to do it becomes easier for them to work towards uh, uh, reaching those goals and understanding what the organization expects from them. Uh, providing individual feedback is part of the performance management process. It is very very essential to give individual feedback to the um, to the employees. Despite the traditional focus on the individual appraisal criteria can include teamwork and the teams can be the focus of the appraisal, but individual feedback is also just as essential. It is it is essential to give the team a feedback as a whole, but individual feedback should also be given from the employees perspective. Um, every employee wants feedback <coughs> sorry um, appraisals can lead to improvement in performance. Why? Because we all want to know where we stand from the perspective of the people who are paying us our salaries. Okay. Fairness requires that differences in performance levels across workers be measured and have an effect on outcomes. How will I know that my the work that I am doing 
is not useful for the organization only when my superior calls me and tells me that this is something you shouldn't be doing only then will I realize this. So, it is very essential assessment and recognition of performance levels can motivate workers to improve their performance. I have, I have mentioned this earlier and I will mention it again I'll repeat this for any human resources manager it is absolutely essential to assess the performance level and recognize levels that are higher than expected. How do you define employees goals and efforts? You assign specific goals, you assign measurable goals. The goals that you assign should be measurable, should be tangible, should be clearly defined. They should also be challenging, but doable. They should not be undoable. You cannot um, you know um, um, ask uh, an employee to work for uh, say 50 or 60 hours a week for a full year. If the other employees are expected only uh, to put in say you know on an average about 40 hours a week that I think would be unreasonable, but asking the employee to work um, say maybe up to 50 hours a week. Uh, every uh, say maybe once a month uh, may be possible maybe and uh, you know telling them that and of course adding more remuneration or or telling them to to uh, I mean depending on the kind of employees that are hired uh, you know the 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 work should be you can't uh, obviously expect all the employees to file patents uh, you know every month that may be a little unreasonable, but then I mean so you know such goals can be decided and of course, in consultation with what the employees can do they should be challenging, but they should not be undoable um, and one should also encourage participation from the employees in deciding their goals. How do you assess objectives? Um, an acronym, I am not a big fan of acronyms, but this seems to be the one very popular in in, uh, in the industry. So, I will use this here, uh, we assess objectives by the SMART method, S stands for specific, objectives should be specific, significant and stretching, they should have room for flexibility for increasing for uh, you know the, the for other things to be covered in their ambit. They should be measurable, meaningful and motivational. There should be some tangible, some quantifiable aspect to the objectives. They should have some meaning for the employee and objectives should be such that the employee is motivated to work uh, towards them. Okay. And then uh, objectives should be attainable they should be agreed upon mutually by the employee and the employer, uh, they should be achievable, they should be acceptable to the employee and they should be action oriented. You cannot say ok, you know uh, uh, you should better your performance next year, yes how so, performance in which field, ok, how will you measure this better performance. So, or you know uh, stretch yourself to the limit, I mean that is such a vague random statement, but you tell people that this is expected of them and, uh, and, and then it will be uh, more measurable and more, more uh, action oriented. So, you tell them that you need to go from point A to point B and they will be, uh, uh, they will know what to do, they should be realistic, relevant reasonable, rewarding and results oriented and achievability is directly related to the realistic aspect. Uh, they should be relevant to what the employee knows and what the employee is working towards. They should be reasonable again achievable, they should be rewarding, there should be some positive aspect to them, uh, something that keeps motivating the employee to keep going and they should be results oriented. Uh, they, sh they should be time based, there should be a timeline. So, please finish x in so many months, please finish y in so many months, they should be timely. The objectives that are set should be set 
in conjunction with the current timeline of the uh, 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 or should be set in conjunction with what is currently happening in the organization and they should be tangible. By tangible I do not really mean touch you should not I mean it is not about physically touching an objective, but one should be able to see the effects from beginning to end. This is something that we discussed yesterday also employees like to see how their efforts what their efforts have produced. So, the beginning and the end of the work that employees put in should be visible to the employees. Some concerns regarding performance appraisals are that some employees feel that performance appraisals are not synchronized with the developing structure of global businesses. Uh, people feel that uh, the, the performance appraisals are not really uh, uh, you know in line or they are not in sync as we say, because uh, uh, appraisals measure what you could have done, but appraisals in many times do not take into account the current challenges that people may have faced while trying to achieve certain objectives and things are changing so fast. Uh, the, the current global business environment is so dynamic, there are so many influences on what people can do and what they uh, the organization uh, expects them to do. So, uh, finding a match between uh, these things becomes difficult, they may not motivate especially if performance appraisals only uh, end up uh, in negative reinforcement, negative feedback to the employees then they may not motivate. How many of us want to be told time and again that you are not doing this so well or if the information that is discussed if whatever is discussed in performance appraisals is has been obvious to the employee throughout. For example, let us take the case of professors, we are told ok your feedback from the students was uh, this in this semester say x in autumn semester, y in spring semester, you published 5 papers, you uh, out of which uh, you know 3 were in international journals, 2 were in national journals, you went on a conference, yes I know that about myself. So, what is the new thing that you are telling me and how is all this that is going to you know how is all this going to affect my position in the organization is what I would like to know as a uh, um, as an active member of the uh, organization what more would you like me to do. And so, if that is all that a, an appraisal a physical face to face appraisal tells me or a written statement containing my appraisal tells me then then that is not really going to motivate me very much because I already know all that. No one is average is another concern that has been uh, shared with uh, regarding uh, performance appraisals which means how do we define this this uh, this uh, utopian average you know how do we define the the benchmark for who is average and uh, that is something that has been under fire for a long long time. People do not know uh, you know where they stand in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the performance uh, you know who are they being compared to and how is this average being defined. The timing may impact the appraisal for example, just before the holiday season people may give very quick appraisal. So, people may get very fast uh, you know people may be uh, appraised uh, <coughs> or people may get very good appraisals just before the holiday season, because uh, the superiors are getting ready to go for a break or just after the holiday season, because people have had a very nice time, but very close to a deadline appraisals may be very bad. So, the timing of the appraisal may not really uh, ref be a true reflection of the actual performance. You know the timing of the appraisal is critical, because the uh, an appraisal done at the wrong time may not be an accurate reflection of how a person has performed. Values, attitudes and behaviors are uh, something else that have been under fire as far as appraisals are concerned. 
and uh, uh, you know they are assessed in terms of outcomes based on competencies demonstrated in achieving the outputs. Uh, and these outcomes are linked with learning, development and experience uh, and uh, uh, they are the ones that are desirable because they are necessary for personal development and performance improvement. Appraisal through generation of examples uh, uh, by examples that demonstrate how their uh, uh, values, attitudes and behaviors contributed towards performance. Uh, so, you know these become more important. For example, 360 degree feedback results in mapping of uh, values, attitudes and behaviors against core values of the organization. 360 degree feedback is the feedback that is given by superiors, subordinates and peers to an uh, individual. I will come back to this table another time. But uh, traditional performance appraisals are usual question and answer sessions with the immediate supervisor. 360 degree feedback is when feedback is given by superiors, subordinates and peers. So, I will come back to it in the next session when we discuss different types of appraisals. Uh, today, we will uh, sort of end the session with uh, or maybe uh, you know I will uh, tell you about how typical employees respond to performance appraisals. Employees are often less certain about where they stand after the appraisal interview than before it because they are given very random vague statements. Employees tend to evaluate their supervisors less favorably after the interview than before it especially if the appraisal contains a lot of negative feedback. Uh, employees often report that few constructive actions or significant improvements resulted from appraisal interviews. Again, in most cases uh, supervisors or superiors see appraisals as a way to pull down the employees to point out their mistakes and not really appraise their uh, positive points because they feel that if an employee has performed well that is what is expected of them, but only when an employee does not perform well are they expected or should they be told and that is I think in uh, not very right. We are all human beings and we all need a pat on the back, um, but that is one reason. Employees feel that the authority or uh, authoritarian tell and sell approach so common in appraisal interviews is completely out of step with today's emphasis um, emphasis on empowerment and workplace democracy. You know somebody says uh, you know this is what I need you to do and now you go and do it and that really does not work. Uh, how do you appraise performance? So, um, I will end the presentation with this slide today. What do you do when appraising performance? Define the job and performance and set achievable goals facilitate performance, tell employees what you expect of them, what they should expect from the uh, organization that they are a part of, how they can uh, you know achieve the goals. So, and give them all the support they need. Encourage performance by giving them a voice, listen to what they say, accept what they say, incorporate what they say in your decisions. Uh, treat all employees consistently, do not have in groups and out groups and blue eyed boys and you know so that does not work. Uh, the rewards that are given to employees should be relevant to what they currently need and what they can do with those rewards. Uh, communicate in advance and communicate clearly about the process of rewards, appraise the performance for heaven sake please do not point fingers at the personality of the employee. Do not make personal comments unless somebody's personality is so disturbing that it disturbs the environment. It may even then it would be helpful to just tell them that you know what you are doing uh, may be disturbing for others. Uh, feedback, give feedback to the employee regarding appraisal and directions for the future. This is what I am going to assess, this is what I would like you to do in future. Some challenges here are what to measure and how to measure and we will talk more about these challenges uh, in the next session, but this is really what I would like you to uh, uh, go through and, and mull over and think about uh, today at the end of this session. We will take it from here in the next session. So, do think about the appraisal process and if possible 
maybe go online and find out what kinds of appraisals are there and if you have personal examples please bring them to class and discuss them with your colleagues and we will take it from here in the next class thank you very much for listening wish you all the best